Bill. Um, good evening, everybody, and um, uh, I would like to welcome you to uh, this, this place called uh, EDA. So we are at the um, Broad Art Center. EDA, I think, stands for Experimental Digital Arts. I'm Professor Erki Hohtamo, one of the professors at the um, Department of Design Media Arts. And it's my great pleasure and honor to invite you to the uh, very special occasion at, at our department. This is um, um, our uh, Regent's Lecture tonight. Um, Regent Lecture is a very prestigious and important institution at the UCLA. So um, Regent's Lecturers are distinguished, highly recognized uh, artists, creators on many fields who are invited for a week to give a lecture, look at student work, and, and in also in our case to do a workshop for the, with the graduate students. So, um, so it is an honor uh, for us, and it's a, I think it's an honor also for the, these distinguished people who get invited to this program. And tonight um, we have a wonderful internationally recognized artist as our guests. And, and I would like to say uh, very briefly some, something about his, his uh, life and career. His achievements are far too long for me to sort of like go through entirely, so I just limit myself to a few details. So our speaker, Daniel Kanogar, um, who was born in uh, Madrid, Spain, is a widely recognized artist creating media installations, photo murals, and site-specific public art project, projects. He's interested in themes related to electronic media, um, also electronic uh, uh, waste, visual excess, and the archaeology of new media. His artistic practice often conceptualizes visual media as sculpture by creating screens with three-dimensional surfaces. Daniel Kanogar's works include numerous public art pieces, such as Waves, a permanent sculptural LED screen for the atrium of the Houston Center, uh, Travestas is a sculptural LED screen commissioned by, for the atrium of the European Union Council in Brussels. And Constellaciones, the largest photo mural mosaic in Europe, created for two pedestrian bridges over the Manzan Manzanares River uh, in Rio Park, Madrid. Asalto, a public participation series, has been uh, projected on various emblematic monuments, including the Arcos de la Lapa in Sa Rio de Janeiro, the Puerto de Alcala in Madrid, San Pietro di Montoria, the church in, in Rome, and a Union Station in, in Toronto. Daniel's recent works include Storming Times Square, uh, which was screened on the LED billboards in Times Square, New York. Small Data, a solo exhibition using obsolete consumer electronics. Quadradura, a series of four installations that use media related to the history of film. Uh, Vortices, an ex exhibition exploring issues of water and sustainability. And su Synaptic Passage, an installation commissioned for the exhibition Brain, the Inside Story, at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And as I mentioned, I just listed a very short, uh, a small amount of da all the Daniel's uh, achievements. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Daniel Kanogar. Thank you. Thank you, Erki. Uh, it was a really nice introduction, and um, thank you very much for having me. It's a real honor. Um, 
I was scared nobody was going to show up, so uh, full house. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start with this image. Um, about 10 years ago, I was going through a lot of changes in my life, uh, career and personal changes. It's kind of going through a crisis. And I started hanging out a lot in junkyards, and I really didn't know why. Let me just put the timer on here. Um, it's one of those things I was just kind of pulled, uh, magnetized by, by places um, all around the periphery of the city of Madrid where, you know, this new kind of landscape was being created. And I particularly like to show this image which shows two things that I'm really in love with. Airplanes and garbage. Um, and even though they seem very different things, I find they're kind of like the bipolar opposites of one reality. Um, I wanted to be a pilot as a, as a child, and I've always loved flying. The experience of flying and the, and the miracle of commercial aviation is something that totally still fascinates me. But in a way, airplanes are also a way of getting away from our garbage. And so in a way, I think my life and my career, my work is always kind of grappling these kind of both extremes. Um, in any case, as so many projects that you start and you don't really know why you're starting them or, or where they're taking you or even how to make this into an art project, if there was an art project. This picture, and these are kind of studies, this picture actually offered a lot of clues to me of what was really in it for me. This kind of pile of mattresses, and there's always mattresses in these junkyards. It's like two things that always appear a lot of are chairs and mattresses. And mattresses are always stained. And they always have, you know, the fluids of life, you know, stain, blood, urine, sperm, stains. And it really got me thinking, who slept on these mattresses? Who dreamt on these mattresses? Who made love? Who was conceived? Maybe even who died on these mattresses? And it really occurred to me that when we throw things away, part of our narrative, part of our history, travels with these objects. And then it really kind of, I really understood that I was really interested in the memory that these objects contain. That they actually, part of our DNA literally is on these objects as they, as they get tossed out. And there's a whole kind of empathy with these, with these uh, discarded elements. And of course, as an artist that particularly is interested in, in technology, I started really gravitating towards e-waste. And empathy, I have a tremendous empathy for obsolete technologies. When I see a computer discarded on a sidewalk, I, I really almost want to go give it a hug and say, you know, you did a good job. You don't deserve this, this kind of ending. You know, you deserve a more honorable kind of uh, send off. And that's really how I feel about a lot of these aging technologies. I, I identify with them because I myself am an aging artist uh, and I question, am I becoming obsolete as an artist, as a human, as a man? So this is kind of the, the, the element that kind of makes me very attracted to, to, to these uh, and identify with these discarded technologies. Um, so I started this, this kind of this hanging out in these junkyards in 2005, and the people that worked there started getting very familiar with, with my presence there. I started talking to them, and eventually they kind of became my friends. And still today, a lot of them come to my exhibitions and my openings. I send them my catalogs. There's like a real connection. And in this case, Ivan, who worked in the biggest electronic uh, recycling center in, in, in southern Europe, he called me and he just said, he often does this, he calls me, says, get in the car, just come on over, I have a surprise for you. And I walked into this, their warehouse, it's enormous, and there were literally thousands of casino slot machines, the old analog versions that were basically being destroyed, not because they weren't working, simply because the new generation of digital um, slot machines were coming in. And it was kind of amazing, you see a sledgehammer, there's not very sophisticated technology, Sledgehammer is basically just hammering and destroying them to separate the wood from the cables, from you know the LEDs, from the different elements. Um, this picture I really like. Um, 
because it has that kind of sense of the, of, of the kind of lined up the, the, the slot machines kind of as if they're going to the slaughterhouse to meet their death. In any case, I ended up salvaging a lot of the broken screens from these machines um, and created, and created um, a panel that's about 15 feet high by nine feet wide with the actual broken pieces from the screens from the slot machines. And what I did is I observed, I went to casinos and in Spain we have a lot of these all over the coffee shops and kind of observed how they blink and flicker and how they kind of seduce us, how they kind of pull us into the, to these artifacts and, and eventually start feeding them money. Um, so I was trying to recreate that sense of, of, the, of this technology, this dead technology, bringing it back to life, highlighting the different kind of details. And the iconography is actually, you know, kind of kitschy, but also uh, in itself kind of significant. There's a lot of, you know, like this forbidden fruit and temptresses. And this is actually start market quotes, um, an allusion to the casino culture that we would all live in. We're all kind of gambling, whether we like it or not. But I also wanted to really give a sense of the work being like a stained glass window, um, except that rather than the religious iconography, there's this new kind of allusion to uh, the new religion of capital is kind of being presented as a, as a new source of fascination. This is the reverse side of the screen, where you can see with one projector what I was doing is I was masking these little details. So when observed from the other side, it looked like the whole kind of artifact was coming to life. And it's really about seeing both sides. It wasn't like I was hiding the side. For me, both of them are, are as, as important. So this is often how I work. As I do go on these excursions, which I always find incredibly kind of beautiful and liberating and fascinating, and I. I, I encounter, you know, sites like this, this kind of mountain of cables, computer, electric, telephone cables, different colors because of the different kind of codes. And when I see images like this, I think of, you know, neurons, and I think of our uh, cable society. I also think of our wireless society making cables obsolete, another element that's kind of slowly being thrown out. And I usually bring these materials to the studio and I start playing around with them. What came out of the cables was this installation called Scanner. And they're just these clusters of uh, discarded cables that I usually uh, um, involve junkyards in the area. This is being a traveling piece. Um, and it's a very, really fun installation to, to put up. It's very organic, very physical. And what I had in this case, seven projectors that were scanning the space with a very simple video animation. It was basically a line to kind of scan the space. And when it hit the cluster of cables, you get this kind of sense of energy coursing through, through the knots of a, of a wire. It's a very um, piece that's very influenced with kind of psychedelic aesthetics and the audiovisual experimentation of the 60s and 70s sense of, of not just watching a screen on a flat surface, but actually entering the work and navigating through it as a kind of strange technological jungle. I have these smaller versions same idea. These kind of clusters are presented as a, almost like as an artifact from another civilization. I have a projector here on the base of the pedestal that's projecting these animations onto the cables, where again you get that sense of the memory of the energy that once traveled through the cables, the data, the conversations. This is actually Cat5 cables, multicolored Cat5 cables. Um, and again, it's very much thinking about an, arch an archaeology of, of, of this material. 
I once had a really fascinating conversation with an archaeologist specialized in Roman garbage. And she told me that archaeologists fundamentally study what other civilizations have thrown away. That's all they really have. And that became like a really interesting idea for me to, to kind of go out and get to know my culture, my society, as uh, if it were something from the past and then trying to understand it by what, what we throw away. Some of these um, clusters of cables, I wanted them to be reminiscent of organs of uh, lungs or hearts or brains, synaptic firing. Um, it's like I always, Donald, I kind of thought of this when I saw a Donald Judd sculpture. Um, I'm kind of the opposite of post-minimalist. I'm very Baroque, so I always want to make things kind of busy and And it, kind of in the same vein, I have this permanent installation in a museum in Spain. It was a commission. Um, well, this is how it was getting built. I kind of took some progress photographs. And it really um, occurred to me that this work kind of referenced not only a brain and, the, and neurological synaptic firings, but also this other brain that we call the internet, something that's so abs abstracted from our cognition to really understand how data transmission kind of uh, travels globally and attempt to kind of make that into a very kind of physical uh, sculpt piece of sculpture. <coughs> Nobody ever wants to pose when I document my work, so you're going to see me a lot. So here the projectors were kind of strategically um, hidden within the clusters of cables to kind of highlight certain, certain areas, certain spots. And again, it's always trying to think of, of, uh, of moving images as, as, as a, having a three-dimensional sculptural presence. And this is a really important element of all my work. Um, why do screens always have to be flat and rectangular and white? Why can they not have this kind of architectural uh, you know, uh, presence in the space that kind of engages you as a spectator in, in, in a, I think, in a more complicated way? So here we're going to start seeing a series of pieces that are more specifically related to the history of cinema. In this case, the first one of the series uh, is made with 35 millimeter film. It's called Flickr. And the paradox of using film as this dying media, not to project movies, but it becomes a screen that receives its memories. So I actually found this film. I installed it in the space. And via a video projection, I try to create this kind of sense of it of moving up and down through the spools. But it's only an optical effect. It's not moving at all. I'm a generation that started with analog photochemical technologies and kind of reinvented myself and dove into digital technology. So a lot of these works have that kind of dialogue between digital and analog. On the back wall of the installation, you see digital code that kind of erupts halfway through the installation and literally silences the projection on the 35 millimeter, 35 millimeter film. How digital technologies more or less basically kill this, this technology. It's kind of it's a very layered piece. In this part of the work, um, I'm projecting kind of very iconic moments of silver screen classics. This is Rita Hayward in Gilda. There's Orson Welles in Citizen Kane. Uh, Anthony Perkins in Psycho. Projected only on these slivers of film. 
when you remove yourself far enough, you can recognize the movies. Otherwise, it's, it gets very abstract. And the kind of the textures and the noise uh, of these old technologies is something that, for many of us that have worked so long with digital technologies, we kind of we kind of miss. In the chronological evolution of the medium, we have VHS tape. This is a, a dial-in for murder by Hitchcock that I found in a dumpster. I removed the tape from the, the cassette. And again, here I'm projecting a very abstract animation, basically a white boat kind of traveling, exploring the, uh, the VHS tape. This detail for me is important. Um, it's kind of pixels projected on this analog uh, magnetic tape. It's rubbing against each other of two eras. Um, it's something that I'm really interested in exploring. How, how one kind of, you know, it's not like this total radical interruption that the human stuff is this kind of hybrid moment where one feeds into the other. The animation is, is very abstract. It's very inspired by Saul Bass, the designer, and he worked a lot with Hitchcock and a lot of his, his uh, title credits uh, with these kind of moving lines and animations that allude to traffic, and to elevators and buildings. Uh, I love Saul Bass's kind of designer. For me, I was thinking of the light traveling along the, the VHS tape as almost trying to decode the audiovisual information that we don't have access to anymore. Because, you know, who has VHS players in these days? Technology is completely gone. So, when, um, oh, yeah, this is. I, actually, this became a series, and depending on what film I would find, I would use that film as inspiration to create a different animation. So this is, for example, the same idea, but in this case, this was Blade Runner, where I tried to create the um, kind of the neon-like palette of a lot of Blade Runner's night scenes. It was the inspiration for the, co the color palette of, of this particular version. Or I've also done this very large version uh, three projector, three layered uh, VHS um, installation, where you can kind of see here the, the wisps of light they're created when projected on VHS, which is actually a shiny material. So when digital television was officially kind of inaugurated in Europe, literally overnight, vacuum, tu vacuum tube TVs were rendered obsolete. And this created a tremendous problem for recycling centers because they were literally receiving just you know millions and millions of these old sets. And this is basically one of the places where they were uh, processing them. There's a, a laser cutter here that splits the tube in half. And here they separate the, the glass from, from these kind of innards, these metallic innards. And I became very interested in the actual screens themselves, which are very industrial like they're metal these kind of metal mesh screens um, they're flexible a lot of them were kind of burnt out in the middle from years and years of use and I started bringing them to the to the studio and playing around with them and eventually created this piece frequency which is kind of a, a little bit of an homage to uh, Nanjun Pike's video walls it's also um, kind of like a patchwork created with in this case, 33 screens, onto which I project two things that we don't really see anymore, white noise and test charts. Something that I remember when I was growing up, falling asleep watching TV, you get up at 3 in the morning with a little bit of dribble coming down your mouth, and you would see a test chart, and you would see you know, the, there was no TV after a certain hour. So now with 24-7 broadcasting, this is something that's totally disappeared. The actual screen is somewhat uh, semi-transparent, so there's some interesting effects of the projection going through the mesh and projecting on the back wall. Uh, 
again, this, this sense of almost presented as a, as a tapestry, as a piece of fabric or textile, that kind of connection between digital imagery as a, an electronic fabric is something that is uh, very, you know, for me, very important, very interesting to, to explore. So the next piece you're going to see as we continue along this journey is a piece I made with DVDs. Um, and uh, I'm not, I'm not going to talk over the, the, the project. Uh, I'll just give you a couple of indications about it. I, I went to a flea market and bought DVDs uh, very cheaply uh, for one euro each. DVDs are now being thrown out in mass. Now it's all about streaming and Netflix. So yet another generation that's uh, kind of disappearing. And uh, I ended up uh, buying 360 movies. I was not buying them because they were interesting films or they were significant films. I was buying them because they were at a flea market and they were being sold for a euro. And flea markets kind of being the last stop before things completely and totally disappear. That, for me, was an important element. I viewed all the, all the films, and I selected um, fragments from each one of them, which is uh, what I'm projecting onto the surface of the DVDs. I'm fine. Fine. <laughs> Stay away from me. Can I swipe? Top drawer, left side, all. Come on, get your ass up. The thing is, the filtering what? process starts. What do you think? Oh. What do you want to do with Donald Trump? I'm getting the shovel first. His name is Donald Trump. I'm going to meet an Altonio Bull Drungeon. Issues of excess of all the thousands of narratives of films we watch through our lives, how they kind of become jumbled up in our in our minds, issues of fragmentation, and also um, just the the kind of the idea of, of the kind of the intangible or um, not really knowing where the actual film is. Is the film contained within the DVD? Is the film you know, on the surface of the DVD? Or is it actually those reflections, which for me are very much about that kind of jumbled mismatch of narratives that we have in our minds? That's kind of some of the issues that I was thinking about in, in this film. 
This is another more recent project. It's an ongoing project. It's called Small Data. Found and broken consumer electronics are presented on these um, kind of uh, shelves, um, almost as still lifes. I really think of them as still lifes. There's an overhead projector, these little Pico projectors that are so really great to work with. And every consumer electronic that I would find determines aesthetically the narrative of the work, the aesthetic of the work. So this is a game board from the 1990s. There's a keyboard. I do a lot of forensic work. When I find, for example, this was part of a scanner, I actually have to get online and try to find what model it belonged to. Um, and through the manual that I eventually download as a PDF, I'm able to kind of bring it back to life through the projection. So again, it's this kind of obsessive um, need to bring these dead technologies kind of back to life. This is a VHS one where the actual fuzz, uh, the kind of the glitchy fuzz you get is very, you know, that in itself was part of the VHS experience, a, a DVD with its own kind of pixelated uh, glitches. A lot, these are from alarm clocks from the seven segment numbers. There's always a very kind of phantasmagorical quality about these found elements. And I, I literally have conversations with these, with these objects as I'm trying to develop a narrative. I, I usually start out by asking them, if you could remember, what would you remember? Tell me. I, like, I have like this kind of imaginary conversation. That is what starts helping me structure the, the narrative, the pieces. And they are very narrative. They're, they're, it's kind of a sculptural narrative. It, Sounds really interesting to think of narrative almost in a three-dimensional way. This is a obviously a calculator from the from the 90s. These uh, cell phones, which seem so ancient, and that are really where we were using them like not even like six, seven years ago. Or these broken circuit boards that I present almost like as ancient archaeological uh, findings, and I kind of reactivate. So this is a, this is actually a series that uh, I keep on wanting to finish, but then I keep on finding a new consumer electronic that um, I want to incorporate into the collection. I can imagine continuing doing this series because there's just the, the accelerated pace of obsolescence. It kind of lends itself for me incorporating new, new um, members to this family. So this may end up being like a lifelong project, uh, who knows. And I just wanted to show you a couple of more recent pieces that I'm, this is all from this year. Canula, as, you, as I'm saying here, it's, uh, these are screen-based pieces. They're streaming connected to the internet. And this abstraction, this kind of painterly abstraction is using as a palette YouTube videos. So the viewer via keyboard introduces a search query and the artwork downloads 100 videos of that search and turns them into this abstraction. So depending on what the search is, you are gonna get certain rhythms, certain colors, certain shapes. You do have the option of actually revealing the, the, the videos. In this case, somebody put knitting tutorials was one of the criteria. So it's an attempt to kind of create a sense of the cognitive overload of this, this immense archive that we call YouTube, the over 4 billion videos. This is totally dynamited. Uh, you know, any kind of audiovisual canon that we had. It's just so difficult to even begin to archive and make sense of this, of this new reality, this new way of conveying and storing and sharing information. And so this is becoming a series of pieces, um, and they're always very much about, about excess, about the excess of information. Uh, this piece um, it's similar, similar idea, and I always present the screens like vertically. They're, they're quite large. 
So CNN updates their videos every 10 to 15 minutes. They have a, a new video. And so they get loaded onto the, onto the artwork. And they just kind of, as they come down, you just get these um, compressed video. The videos themselves are kind of compressions to align and leave a ripple as they come down. Um, every now and then, they pop open so you can actually see what the news is. And of course, the new pieces of information are covering the, the, the previous news cycle. So there's this constant replenishing of, 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 of this piece, which I also want it to look very textile-like, like very much like fabric. Again, this, this kind of social fabric that's created with the 24-7 the news cycle that is incessantly trying to kind of catch our attention, this impossible a rhythm of, of trying to stay on top of what is happening in the world. A little technical problem. My computer is becoming quite obsolete. And I, I'm really having a hard time saying goodbye to it because I fall in love with them. I really, it's been a wonderful companion. So just moving on a little bit, um, I want to talk about some of my public art commissions. And this is kind of being an accidental journey. In 2006, the city of Madrid asked me to do something with this monument. Uh, which is in is central Madrid now, but it was built in the 1770s and was an actual gateway to the city. At night, they would close the gates. This was when it was still a walled city. And it was a way of controlling who could go into the court and who couldn't. Uh, you would actually pay taxes here if you were coming to sell your potatoes or your tomatoes or your merchandise. This is where you get stopped. And it was basically our version of immigration border this is what it was. And I decided to create these, uh, this video, this looping video uh, of climbing bodies, this kind of clandestine night entrance into the city. I was very um, kind of influenced. So I was very um, kind of this was this picture is from 2006, um, and these are Africans jumping the fence into Europe. Spain has these two areas in northern Africa, Ceuta and Melilla, which are obviously they're, they're European. And so usually what they do, um, they, they storm the fence at night, and they go in large groups, and they climb the fence, and you know, they do it in big groups because they have a better chance of getting into Europe that way. And this information started. Um, coming through and we started getting this, this started hap happening basically in 2006. It started really getting a lot of media attention. And I was kind of fascinated by these images. I was kind of, there was something very desperate and survival instinct um, in them. There's also kind of an identification with them. This, this kind of surmounting obstacles to improve your life. We all have our own kind of obstacles. So I created these artworks. It's a series that I, it's, I, they keep on asking, asking me to do it. I've done it, I think, already over a dozen, in a dozen different places, usually projected on significant historical monuments. Uh, this is a church in Rome, in San Pietro in Montorio in Trastevere. This was in a historical viaduct in, um, in northern England, one of the first bridges that was built for the first railroad to take a coal out of the area. This is a medieval palace in Spain. And every time I do it, it kind of changes uh, the, um, the kind of the nature of the work. I always use local people, like I do actually a film recording. Sometimes it even happens live. So people participate, and then they see themselves about a minute later climbing the facade. But there's always a sense of a storming of a monument. Of, and, and it's kind of tongue in cheek, as in the storming of the Bastille or the storming of the Winter Palace, the sense of the people uh, you know, taking over and making, claiming a monument that somehow seems like we more, more 
increasingly feel we don't own or don't belong in the cities we live in. So there is a little bit of a, an agenda there. This is the largest version I've done in Times Square. It's called Storming Times Square. You'll see a little bit how, how, how the project is. There's a performative element that's also very important for me in these projects where people participate and then they watch other people participating. So you're an actor, you're a spectator, and in, in any event, it's, uh, well, it's This was screened every night uh, in Times Square. It's part of a project, ongoing project it's called Midnight Moment. Every month, a different artist is invited to use the screens. Forty, I, in my case, there were forty-seven of the LED billboards in Times Square. And as somebody that's interested in, as somebody that's interested in kind of thinking about these kind of media facades and thinking of screen as sculpture, in this case, as architecture, to be able to have this kind of 34 story canvas. It's, you know, it's really exciting. This is the NASDAQ building. It's particularly satisfying. Of course, Times Square is, in, that, in essence, New York's uh, town square, and yet it's so commercialized. It's, you know, it's it's really so much about advertising. It was, uh, for me, there was kind of an interesting gesture, kind of handing over these spaces of commerce to to just everyone who participated. Over 1,500 people have participated in the project, uh, which is. I was filmed for four days, and that's the amount of people that participated. Um, there's all these wars going on by the different vendors. Um, it's uh, incredible they can get as many as they do, because they're very competitive with each other. And so, like for example, the, the Disney screen, they are, they're on and off all the time depending on who the artist is. Um, there's a lot of politics in, around Times Square. It's like Glengarry Gen Ross, that movie. It's a little bit like that. It's very cutthroat. So no, you can't get all the screens. But you know, it, it, they seem to be getting more and more as different projects get, uh, get, um, get up on the screens. And then I also wanted to talk about this, this kind of this vein of work. Um, in 2006, I was asked to do a commission for the European Union Council in Brussels. So this is the equivalent of our House of Representatives in Europe. And I was flew into Brussels to like take a look at the space, the atrium of the space. And as I walked into it, my heart kind of sunk. It was like, this space is awful. And I had no idea what I could possibly do with such an uninspired building. Um, yet it's so kind of politically significant in, in Europe. I was kind of shocked to see you know, how impoverished the, 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 the conception of the space was. This up here, these windows here, this is the actual commission. 
So this is where all the heads of state get together and slug it out, trying to figure out our you know, huge problems we have in Europe right now. And in fact, part of the problem, I think, is this building is what is really kind of killing us. I just kind of hung out, as I often do when I get these commissions. I just kind of hung out in the space. And I'm actually, part of me is like trying to focus and try to like, OK, let's, you know, let's, what can I do with this space? But inevitably, inevitably, your mind wonders. And what I started kind of seeing, almost without really wanting to, is this carpeting and all these people, all these bureaucrats and heads of state and you know, all kinds of the whole secretarial administrative departments of the, of the European Union streaming along this vertical line back and forth. This is the actual entrance into the building. But, and there is something so linear and so kind of this kind of, I don't know, like little ants walking back and forth. It occurred to me, and this is like a little quick uh, 3D render that I did. It would be interesting to create this kind of carpet that had this kind of looping, curving shape that mirrored the linearity of, of what was on the floor. Um, I went to a coffee shop. And I, I like to show this image because this is a coffee shop next to the European Union. And I asked the, the bartender if they had some scissors. And they gave me some pencil. And I started kind of doodling. And I like to show this picture because it really, is a, it really shows the kind of the humble origins of art. I mean, every project starts with nothing, with a piece of paper, a pencil, scissors. And it's even, and I think that's one of the big struggles as artists that we have, is to kind of believe that these kind of seeds of ideas can actually grow and become something. And well, this actually did grow and became, and became this piece. And this was a flexible LED screen the, the shape of the screen was determined by how it was suspended by the ceiling. It's a low resolution screen, but it um, allowed me to really explore this kind of concept of the screen as sculpture. The screen as something that breaks away from that kind of flat um, rectangular surface that is so, you know, for me, too present and, and so limiting in how we can interface and, and respond. and. Uh, interact with, with screens. So this, be, this has kind of become a, a line of, of um, the commissions, usually permanent art commissions that I've done in different locations. This is a, a continuous uh, looping screen. The content is always local. It's very specific to the, the, the location where I usually have a perform, performative kind of event. Uh, users of the space participate, and that's the, the material that I use to create the artwork. The screens are getting thinner and thinner. The uh, LED tiles that are used are custom made for my studio. Uh, I have a fabricator that um, I, you know, it's, does these uh, for, for my work. And they really are able to respond very directly to the architecture that contains them. And this is one of the exciting elements about it. It's not just something that I duplicate from one space to another. Because as you can see, they also light up this space. So the, the screens themselves are kind of having these brush strokes of color fields that illuminate the space that contains them. So anyway, this is an ongoing series that I'm working on, and we'll hopefully we'll continue to, to explore its potential. Just quickly to start wrapping up, I just wanted to give you a 
few projects that I'm working on right now. And um, the first project that I want, I want to tell you about is this DVD piece. And because I'm seeing all these DVDs getting thrown out, and I have this kind of compulsive need to save them from extinction, and I keep on buying them and buying them, um, I'm going to be doing this piece. It's opening uh, March 25th in, in the museum in Spain. It will be a traveling piece. It's 2,500 DVDs. Um, all the movies are going to be viewed. And I'm going to create this kind of massive uh, projection. It's going to be four, four synchronized projectors that will be projecting onto the DVDs. This is obviously a, a montage, a photo montage that I created to, 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 uh, to basically to get a commission. I've been for three years. I've been trying to get this work commissioned. Finally, I got a bite. So I'm, I'm thrilled. It's logistically it's complicated uh, because there are just so many layers of film that each little DVD has its own video clip that needs to be synchronized and choreographed with all the others. So anyway, this is, this is a piece that is presenting many technological challenges. I hope I survive and make it to March 25th, and the piece looks uh, as good as it does on the simulation. This is a commission I'm doing right now for Tampa Airport. Uh, there are going to be LED screens that are going to be wrapping around the truss system of the terminal, the main terminal in the airport. Um, it's inspired by um, paintings of ruins from mostly French landscape painting, typical images of plants and vines invading architecture, abandoned architecture, in this case, uh, the screens are going to depict South Florida native vines invading the architecture of the, of the terminal. The piece is going to be generative. There's going to be an algorithm that will decide the speed at which the plants grow, how many you know, leaves or flowers they have. Uh, I'll be planting new species through the years. I'm really going to think of this work almost like a garden that needs to be tended through the years. And in fact, it is a little bit of a, uh, you know, medit I kind of am trying to reflect a little bit of, of, of this kind of generative algorithmic work as being a second nature in itself, where the algorithm is going to allow it to be, uh, behave in ways very similar to how nature, how specifically how plants grow and develop and, and permutate. And then the third series that I'm working on, which um, I'm having a lot of dilemmas about, but I'm, you're, you're the first people that are seeing it, are these um, sculptural um, screens that are kind of um, want to look like anticipated ruins, like ruins of screens. Um, they're going to be low resolution screens, and they're all they're kind of the innards of a screen are going to be exposed. Uh, the, the, the work in itself um, is very much about kind of a fatigue. I want the screens to feel very fatigued from this overwhelming sense of representation. They always have to represent, represent, represent. I almost feel like screens are kind of rebelling and saying enough is enough. We just want to be ourselves. And that basically means uh, a, 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 an investigation of the materialness of the screen not as a window to another world, to another space, to another representation, but really emphasizing the materialness, the LED points, the cables, the, the sending and receiving cards uh, that are going to be very much part of the, part of the work. So this is a, an exhibition that I'm developing, and it, it's going to open in, in a show I have in, in February. So The content is going to be very abstract. And it's also going to kind of flicker. And uh, um, similar to my CNN, CNN piece and my YouTube piece, it's kind of going to be connected to streaming information um, of, of different, different kinds that's going to be picking it up and will only be represented on the screens as flickers and as kind of slight you know, uh, interferences, disturbances of the signal. But it will be a very kind of abstract piece. I don't want them to represent anything but themselves. 
almost like these kind of sensing organs that this could this will be a, like a, a five screen installation where it becomes this kind of tangle of of surfaces and again a little bit of an homage to you know the light artist uh, you know Terrell and Weaver and all these great artists Robert Irwin color field work has been a huge influence always loved their work so um, that's definitely going to be part of the part of the experience of the work is how they illuminate the space that's containing them so um, I think that's a wrap thank you very much I think we have some time for some questions. If there's anybody who has some questions, I'd be happy to. Yeah, there's a mic if anybody. Okay, so Christian, why don't you, Jesse, can you bring Christian a microphone? Yeah, Echo, can you bring it up to Christian? Jesse, right at the front. Can you raise the light, please? Right, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring you a microphone. Jesse, they need the lights. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so the, qu the question I have, um, taking the example of uh, the uh, CD piece you showed at the end with two, what was that, uh, 2,500 CDs you're planning to install on the wall, it's a, it's a technical question I have, a curiosity. Um, I would imagine that you, you, that you mount your CD compilation first, and then you sit quite a while in space, in this space, to do all the masking uh, with the computer. Or I'm actually just curious how you how you manage to create a work like this uh, in the museum. Well, it's a video mapping, the way I've done it before. It's a video mapping piece. As you say, we first put up the DVDs, and then we mask one DVD at a time. On site, right? On site. And the, um, the actual piece, the one that you've, the finished piece, that has 360 uh, DVDs, each DVD had its kind of mask to make it circular, and there's another mask under it to not project on the, on the surrounding uh, DVDs. So in fact, it was a really interesting render because it was, it's 360 times 3 is 1,080 layers of, of content that needed to be rendered. Uh, and that was like, you know, four years ago before the, the Mac Pros were out. So it was a real rendering challenge. So how long new, will it take to, version, to do such a thing? The new version, this large version, I, we, it would be too much to be able to, um, to map, to video map and mask like there physically. So for, I've been fortunate enough to get a grant now to develop a tracking system so that it would just automate that process and make it way more fast. So that's something that we're developing in the studio right now. Yeah. So the, um, do we have other questions? So please use this opportunity. All right. Um, how did you d develop like um, the video for like storming over the walls pieces like did you write a program that would um, basically take the video of the people and like or like how did you do that in general Sorry, what pieces are you referring the to? storming over the walls or the, the ones where the people were climbing over the walls well you saw it a little bit on the Times Square piece there's a green screen surface an overhead camera that's connected to my computer so I'm watching as people are participating and I'm watching them on the screen and uh, you know I've done this as live editing and I've also okay. just filmed it and then edited uh, after in After Effects but it's it's always kind of like this basic and always where I do the video shoot is also important I don't just do it anywhere I usually do it if possible in front of the monument or very close to it so there's that dialogue um, with with the with the surface that's going to get projected on um, one of the things that's also kind of fun about that work is um, how people bring in their own material. I kind of set the stage, and it is a very kind of specific participation that I'm eliciting. But uh, it's really interesting to see the variations that people bring in, and and the stories also that they kind of enact. You know, climb this, this idea of climbing, but it's also about crawling. 
And, I, and I've become very attached to this gesture that we all in this room, basically, at one point in our lives as infants, we crawled. It was kind of our first adventure. It was our first exploration of space. It was the first time we kind of moved away from the safety of the mother. So there was something kind of primal also about going back to that phase that we many of us forget. And it's incredible to see some people how easily they can still do it and how other people literally can hardly move as they're struggling to get to the other side of the green screen. So in itself, uh, it's interesting to kind of observe that. Yes. So, thank you so much for this talk. It was very inspiring, and um, thank you. I'm sure the students are looking forward to a workshop with you. I have a question that connects to the climbing bodies. Uh, you were very clear about your intent, and that intent seemed to be really powerful initially, but as it kept going, it seemed to be become more and more of a kind of a graphic aesthetic. Does this concern you, given the initial intent? Uh, a little bit, yes, to be honest. Um, you know, it's kind of the thing is that as the work evolved, or as the, as the you know, because it's always usually, I, I, I don't decide where I can do these commissions. I did one two weeks ago in Union Station in Toronto. And it really varies a lot from one um, iteration to another. It has become kind of more playful uh, in a way. But I would like to somehow, if this project keeps on um, unfolding, which it seems like it, it does, because again, I keep on getting calls to, 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 you know, to do this project in different buildings. I would also, particularly in Europe, where, where uh, you know, this idea of borders and immigration has become such a huge issue. I would love to be able to bring this issue back to, to the fore. But I would need the right kind of monuments. You know, I would need to do it on the fence itself that separates Europe from Africa or other, so many other walls in Palestine or, you know, the, um, you know, of course, the whole thing of Donald Trump's wall, we can't even hardly speak about that without pulling our hair out. But, um, so I, I, you know, it would be interesting for me to have the right kind of surface to project and to uh, bring back that element. In the meantime, a lot of these projects are very much about kind of, for me, the kind of more political edge. And I don't want to exaggerate them because it's not, it hasn't, it's not a highly politicized project. But it is about wanting the public citizens to project themselves, you know, literally, but also metaphorically onto their cities. And I do find that in this kind of privatization of, of cities, of, of our experience of cities, we have less and less occasions to feel like we are participants, active citizens, uh, and that we can actually be part of these communities. We just become, become kind of spectators that, that receive these kind of spectacles and the and, and you know the, the urban developments are kind of given to us and so I, I'm, I'm interested in that kind of idea of, of projecting that we can project that this let's claim this monument let's claim this building let's claim this surface as something that belongs to us in a again tongue-in-cheek in a revolutionary way so we have thank you oh um and, and thank you too uh my question's related and shorter uh, I wondered how many people, was this 2007, the projection of the people in climbing, 2006? 2006. 2006. Um, at the time, was it, was, was it explicitly about the migrants in the African colonies like, like Melilla and Sirto who were doing that climbing? Because that wasn't really well known in the U.S., but was that known and recognized that that's what you were doing for that piece? Uh, well, I mean, it wasn't like explicitly explained, but a lot of people, uh, it, was, it was on for one night. And because we, had, we all had it in our minds, it was on the news like basically every night. Right. Because it was like the first wave of information. This has probably been going on for a while, but suddenly just the media started really paying attention to it. So a lot of people would immediately, either they would send me pictures to say, look, this is like your piece. I was like, yeah. Definitely. So um, it wasn't like something that was completely 
like explained, you know, I mean, the, 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 the piece was called Clandestine, Clandestinos was the name of the piece. So that also kind of, you know, had that sense of a clandestine entry into, into this forbidden area. Uh, but there's also, uh, yeah, a lot of people did, rec did make that connection. Probably a lot of them didn't, but um, there was, for those who wanted to see it, it was definitely very welcome. Makes sense, thank you. Um, Daniel, I've been really inspired by what you're showing us. Um, and I'm thinking about something at the very beginning we started with um, you showing the, the scrap yards and junk yards and talking about wanting to hug computers and that are left on the street, you know, abandoned in monitors. And I feel very simil similarly. And I'm wondering as you've scaled up and gotten larger public commissions, um, you know, we, you ended with showing us your commissions that are coming forward in, in airports and things like that. Do you, th do you think about, do you deal with, it's also okay to say no, um, and it's something maybe I have to tackle or we all have to tackle individually, how do we deal with creating more trash, particularly as media artists, um, digital designers, new media artists, how do we deal with consumption in our own work and the implications of that? Is that something that you spend a lot of time dealing with yourself um, in different materials? And yeah, I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are on that. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I don't present, I wish I could be completely coherent on this, but I, I'm not. And that's for me was interesting. Uh, I wanted to start out with that image of the airplane and the garbage. I don't think it's a coincidence that this project that I'm doing now in an airport is an LED screen, which are kind of like air, the airplanes in my, in my psyche. And, and I have these kind of bipolar pulls where I'm very attracted to this kind of the new you know, gadget, the new technology. There are phenomenal inventions, really amazing, that we, we, you know, we need to appreciate. And, and, you know, but, but I do, I'm very aware of that, that waste. I'm also very aware of it because I've seen it day in and day out, this time that I spent in these places. It's really crazy when you see a truck load come into the, to the junkyard and just throw out this mountain of MP3 players that are still in their cases and have not even been opened, have not even been used. And when I'm talking about a mountain, I'm talking about as big as this room, a brand new MP3s are being thrown out. And you just see this day in and day out, it really does something to your mind. And so I'm, I'm very conscious of that and I don't have a solution and I'm very frustrated. I think a lot of it has to do with legislation. The French government is the French uh, first government that's actually started um, to find uh, calculated obsolescence as something that's kind of like a crime against humanity, which in it, it is every update, every update is basically renders millions, millions of devices obsolete almost overnight, you know? So, I mean, small data, that series is my kind of tiny way of kind of really thinking about that. And of course the paradox is the projector that I'm using to activate those pieces in itself will become obsolete and will itself become trash and it, I'll have to make an art piece. I'll have to include that as part of the project. So I don't have a solution. I just have the concern. I have the, the, that kind of contradiction in my work uh, that maybe one day those two worlds will come together. But uh, yes, and that's why I'm so interested in, in kind of the junkiness of technology. You know, it's, it's the, 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 the excrement of technology is something that I think kind of really brings me back down to the ground and, and kind of something that, I, that I, I need to physically, you know. And that's also part of the materiality, the physicality of my artwork has a lot to do with that kind of junkiness of the materials of technology. So I don't, I don't have a clear answer. I wish I did, but I'm definitely, it's a dilemma for me. Hi, your work is so great. Um, I, I have a few things to say. One is I, I am really interested to see what happens with the most recent work with the fatigued screens. I feel like it, it really appears to be a chapter, not only 
a chapter in a story for the screens, but also in the work that you do, this kind of like, finally the, the screen itself has an expression and it has a, like an, an energetic expression that's interesting to see. Um, but my question, I was really, um, I could really relate to a lot of your work, including the, um, the DVDs um, with the projections on them. I'm curious if you've ever, I'm a musician and um, I've, I've put out CDs and it's, it's a really interesting thing to see for myself and also for all of my friends who are musicians who've put out CDs that we have piles of, of music and <laughs> we have piles of CDs that you can't sell anymore. And, um, and this is, you know, every once in a while I hear this question come up where people are like, what do you do with 2,000 CDs that are like your CDs that you can't sell? <laughs> and, and, um, and it's not only like a death, a death of a medium, but it's also part of the death of the music industry itself and, and the way that people create a particular art that people want to consume, but you can't actually, the thing that you used to make money with and like be able to hand to somebody, you can't actually, like it doesn't have any value anymore. So, so I'm curious if you ever, if, if you think about the kind of bridge, I mean, I know your work is visual and that the representation of the 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 visual film films that are on the the CD or the DVDs themselves, like I can understand that connection. But um, I'm curious if you've considered that kind of concept of how how that's also happening within the music, not just with music, but in the music industry itself. Yeah, it'd be interesting to do a kind of a sonic landscape with um, with uh, uh, you know music. Says CDs. Or, uh, I didn't really explain the sound in the um, DVD piece, mm -hmm. which is an automatic composition that emerged just from all the fragments of the films that were getting simultaneously projected, and the sound quality, uh, which is you know you don't really get it here, but um, you know if you get a movie from the 40s, it's kind of very kind of tinny, metallic-y kind of sounds, kind of hollow. If you get like a typical Hollywood production you know, of a, a, some kind of adventure movie, there's all this kind of really intense bass. Um, the new large piece that I'm preparing out of actually collaborating with a sound composer, with a composer, to really be able to uh, articulate that kind of sonic experience in the artwork that is so much about, about films. Specifically about, uh, you know, just CDs and, 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 and sound I haven't, I'd be very curious, that's a good, good idea. But if there's one thing that you said that really interested me. This kind of the idea of the death of, of, of an industry, of the you know, musical industry. Um, you know, it's really, I start out talking about the memories associated to what it gets kind of tossed out. And it's personal memories, but it's also collective memories that get thrown out. And I am very particular in that kind of personal collective, um, kind of rescuing that and bring it to the present because there's this kind of sense of this kind of perpetual present that we live in this kind of amnesia of everything is co our constantly updated selves. We don't even have time to reflect on, on where we're coming from. And that, that is kind of like this thread that goes through all my work is anxiety about memory loss, uh, both personal both and collective. I'm very fearful of that. And my whole work is a struggle and attempt to prevent that from happening. So, yeah. Maybe we can take one more. So, I'll give to Lauren and... So, Lauren, this is a uh, concluding question. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering where you d draw the line of obsolescence when you choose the technologies. So, like, you could probably find an iPhone 6S in the trash yard, but your phone installation has much older phones. And then, you know, DVDs or CDs in many parts of the world are still like a very uh, active medium. So how do you determine, is it site specific or how do you make that distinction between what is obsolete and what is not? If I find it in the flea mark and the junkyard, it's, it's game for my work. <laughs> Simple answer, but. But it is, it is kind of like a, this is not a very specific moment. They can say, okay, now this is obsolete. But, 
but there is that sense of when, when, it, when it is tossed out, that's when I become very interested in it. And I will probably eventually have to do something with the iPhone 6, or iPhone in general, the new, the new generation. Uh, I've, I've kept all my iPhones, and um, uh, you know I keep all my obsolete technologies. I haven't thrown out a single one. And I think the natural death of these, these uh, devices is to make an art piece out of them. So. But, but yeah, it is, it is happening faster and faster, and um, it almost feels like eventually it's just gonna catch up, you know, like, and, and it is, you know, that one, one, one of the questions I ask myself a lot, and I think hopefully this is something that's gonna come up in the workshop that starts tomorrow, is, is why is there this kind of cultural need for, for the, you know, shiny, spanking, brand new device? Is it a fear of death? Does it make us just feel a little bit younger for a little longer? And then the minute we get it nicked and dented, it's like, oh, that's again reminds us of our, of our destiny and our, our uh, rendezvous with, with death down the, down the lane. I, I'm kind of interested in those questions. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I have a <coughs> actually a very uh, sort of like short question for you to conclude. So because the, so Daniel, um, Daniel has studios in Ma Madrid, Spain, and in New York. And I have heard some rumors that you might be opening a third one in LA, so which would- No, closing, New changing New York for LA. Okay, so what's it, what is it? So closing, closing New York and moving to LA. Yeah. And is that going to happen, Daniel? You're putting me on the spot. One, one, of, one of my big disappointments about LA is that the, the real estate rental thing is in the last few months has gone completely insane. I always seem to come late to these to these movements. I would love it. My mother's from Los Angeles. I I like the community, the art community here. Um, I, I I hope that I can make that dream happen. It's a dream. It's it's a dream that I've always had. And uh, it would be it would be wonderful to be able to make that happen. Yeah I think we would all all be happy to have uh, Daniel join the LA arts community. So with that, so Daniel, thank you very much thank for you. your presentation. <laughs>